Today we are going to welcome Dr. Paul Swift from now Olive University and our own North Carolina State University. Dr. Paul Swift is a professor of economics and finance at the University of Mount Olive and teaching assistant professor of the sitting in front of the camera in free market economics at North Carolina State University. Dr. Paul Swift is renowned for his work in Austrian economics and specifically the Austrian business cycle theory. He has countless articles published in major economic journals and is a profound <laughs> member of the Mises Institute. Very famous. Today he will be speaking on Menger and the early Austrians. With that, AEF welcomes Dr. Paul Swift. Thank you. Uh, they, they're they're uh, entirely comfortable, the number of articles. Um, so I, I promised uh, my, my students, so uh, Mike and Dean, uh, that, that I would be here without a tie or anything, uh, because right after this I, I go fencing and, and I'm intent on stabbing people. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Dean then ruined it all by saying that he wanted to record this, and I said, oh, sure, you can record it, but then, then I had to not, not be a slob. So, anyway. so. Um, before we get into the, the uh, presentation, um, last year I worked on, on an economics app, an Austrian economics app. And so if you have uh, Android, you can go to the Google Play Store. If uh, you have Apple, you can go to the Apple App Store and just search for Austrian economics and then Civitas, because uh, that's the, the group that I worked with. And it pulls up, um, their downloads this app, it's completely free. Uh, we have more than tens of people who have uh, already downloaded it. I think we're already in the triple digits, so uh, uh, it's, it's chock full of, uh, of really good stuff. Okay, so um, we said this year that what we wanted to do is we want to go back and, and sort of reintroduce who uh, the Austrians are, give a little bit of their background, why they're different, why they're, they're called Austrians. So, uh, so we start at the beginning of the Austrian school with uh, Karl Menger. So, so here's Karl Menger. Um, he did start off as an economist. He actually worked for a newspaper. In fact, he worked for nine different newspapers. Uh, and from this, uh, from journalism, he, he thought this is how prices are formed. And from this, he, he wrote this book called The Principles of Economics back in 1871. And he was part of what is known as the marginalist revolution. And so, at this time, we had three people basically write about the same issue, marginalism, or at the margin. Uh, and this was uh, Karl Menger in, in Austria, in Vienna, in um, uh, Louisiana School in 1874, we have Leon Walras, and then we have William Stanley Jevons in England in 1871. And they all basically were overturning what the classicals were saying. Um, and so, based upon the strength of this book, he was actually awarded an assistant professorship at the University of Vienna. So a little bit about what he did. He was uh, a tutor to the Crown Prince back in 1876. He was appointed to the Chair of Political Economy. And then he retired in, in 1903. Now, one of the, the things that, that he was well known for was having a massive library. Now, unlike the, uh, the app that has links to articles and such, obviously they didn't have any such a thing. And so books were expensive, right? Uh, so he had students that would come over and use his personal library. And uh, he was pretty famous for this. In fact, the uh, Japanese government bought his library, and uh, that made the core of their national library. You can find it today at uh, this university, uh, not even Ito Tsubashi, I don't know. University, that was pretty bad, so, uh, in, in Tokyo. Uh, his papers are, of course, at Duke University, and uh, I've lived here for far too long and not seen them yet, so you should make like a field trip or something. It's a good idea. All right, so why is Karl Menger so important? Well, there are four key areas that uh, we can focus on, his major contributions. So the first one is, of course, what I've alluded to is development of marginal analysis. Uh, the second one is his victory of the Methoden strike. 
Uh, the third is the use of the genetic causal approach in, in explaining these, these social dynamics. And then using this approach, he showed how money must originate from the market, that it can't be imposed upon a people by a king or a queen or anything. So let's take a look at the first one. So Menger changes the way that, that economists then look at, at how goods and services are, are valued. And so he said that, that goods and services are valued because people find them useful. This is a subjective valuation. Now notice that this is a big change from the classicals who are saying that the amount of labor that's put into this is the formation of value. And so he over, he's overturning this notion of the labor theory of value. And he argues that, that usefulness or demand isn't enough to, to simply uh, create the, the value of, of the good. Um, the good does not have economic value if it's not scarce. In other words, if there's so much of this good, then I, and I can apply it to all the various ends that I have, and then there's still some left over, well, then it has no economic value. So it's not just demand. Demand isn't enough. We have to use demand and this, uh, this supply or the scarcity facet of it. Um, if we look at uh, some of the more modern textbooks like uh, the Hain book, they'll say things as the relationship between availability and desirability, or supply and demand. So the value then is associated with supply and demand, but it's also at the margin or the, this next unit, so a plus one unit or a minus one unit. So then measure then gets into cost. Now he says that the cost of a choice is not based on the input. So the value of, of something, right, this water bottle, the cost of the plastic doesn't cause the price. Instead, what we see is that it's the other way around. The cost of any decision is the marginal satisfaction of something else foregone. And, and this is an allusion to uh, opportunity cost. So we have these choices, choice A versus choice B. Which one are we going to decide? Well, we need a little more information. So if choice A, I have an expenditure of $100, revenue of 150, what's my rate of return? 50%. If I have another one, which is also a $100 expenditure, uh, it will yield me $120, then I have a 20% a rate of return. So which do I end up choosing, right? Well, this is easy, right? A, it's bigger, right? More return. What's the cost? Well, it's not the $100. It's the next best thing that I could have obtained for this decision, right? The cost of my choice is the 20% I could have received, right? with choice B. And so as conditions may change, so suppose that an input price goes up so that my, my expenditures go up. Now what's the cost of my decision of A? That's well, still the 20%, right? That hasn't changed. On that slide, the, the green stuff you just got added, I, can't, I don't know where that comes from. I just drew it. But from the, it, I don't see how it comes from the numbers. Where do you so, get 110? Well, suppose that, that um, the price of steel goes up, and I'm a manufacturer, I use so steel. Not, okay, okay. And so, so, so the, costs, the costs are that I have to outlay, my expenditures is going up, okay? Okay, so, so the, the cost then of the decision, if, we keep, if the price of steel kept going up and up, what would we see? Well, eventually, this will be my decision, and then whatever that rate of return, say if it's 18%, then that will become my cost. If we look at this in uh, finance, right, this would uh, be akin to our weighted average cost of capital. Okay, yes? Um, on that previous slide, once you get to 130, mm -hmm. it's not just equivalent, but it's a worse, a choice A would be worse. Yeah, right, we would choose B. So you're not just looking at the $20, you're looking at also the expense. Well, I'm, I'm trying to do it in percentages to try to, to, try to uh, compensate for that, but I mean it's just a crude example. I'm trying to you know, just illustrate the one point. Okay, so um, so Menger and the Austrians then argue that the problem with the classical economists is they they screwed up ends and means. They uh, they confused them. So the value 
doesn't go from the input to the consumer good. It's, it's the other way around. I value the consumer good, and then based on the valuation of the consumer good, then the value is imputed back to those factors of production. So the, the inputs only have value because of the value of the final output. So I might have lots of skills where I could juggle things and whistle a popular tune and you know maybe be on a beach ball and, and you'd be like, wow, that's an amazing talent, but its value is zero if nobody wants to see me do that. Okay, so in this case then, labor is a means, it's not an end. And so it does not determine the value of the output. So the amount of labor that we put into something is not determining the value. And so that's his argument against the classical labor theory of value. So that's his first major contribution. Now, of course, we're going fast uh, for this because um, lots of ground to cover. Menger is much more rich than this, this what I'm presenting here. Uh, so let's take a look at the, the Metoden strike. Now, this is basically means the, the struggle over methods, and we have two groups over here. We have the, the German historical school headed by uh, Rocher and then his protege, Gustav von Schmoller, uh, and they're arguing against Menger. What the, what's the argument about? They're asking this question. Are economic laws, are they universal, or are they specific to a, a particular historic era, or a locality, or a nationality? And so, so what do we mean by that? Well, the German historical school said that economic laws are very specific. So what works for 19th century Britain is good for 19th century Britain, but maybe not good for France, maybe not good for Germany, maybe not good for Japan or any other country. Or what's good in the 1900s might not be good in the 1800s or the 1500s. And so you have to constantly adapt and adjust. And so the German historical school was saying you have to just compile lots and lots of data then in order to understand what those particular rules are. Menger, of course, completely disagreed with this. He said that these are universal, that these laws apply to all people under all circumstances and all of time and of all of place. And so there is this big clash, this big battle. And out of this big battle, we see uh, a much larger battle taking place between the, the Austrian Empire, right, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and the rise of the German state. In fact, Germany was winning wars, actual little battles, and the Austrians were losing. In fact, it was unpopular to be Austrian. And so the, the German historical school said, Menger, what does he know? He's merely an Austrian. And his Austrian school, right? And that's where the, the phrase Austrian school or Austrian economics originates from. It was this derogatory phrase. <laughs> History is interesting, though. Okay. Menger also said that not only are these laws universal to all people, but they also have extensions outside of economics. Right? So we can apply them to uh, the law, languages, uh, the state, even to morals. And so it's a much broader scope of social science than what, uh, what the German historical school was, was talking about. So what was Menger's approach? Well, Menger's approach was this thing called the genetic causal relationship. And so what he's saying is that there's a process, right? And so how do we then uncover this complex phenomenon that's going on in this market? You have prices, you have wages, you have interest. How does this occur? Well, he says what we have to do is we have to break it down to the, to the simplest element and build up from there. So the simplest element is, is the, the, the genesis, the, the genetic part. And then we start looking at the causal relationships. So he says the institutions and phenomena of the market are most often the unintended consequences of the individual's actions. And so here we're looking at, at uh, some of the Scottish philosophers like Adam Ferguson who are saying that, that what we are experiencing here, what we are witnessing is the result of human action but not of human design. No one sat down and planned the market process. So, so it's this unintended consequence that, what, that we have to study. So in order to understand all of this, we 
You have to reduce them down to the simplest elements and then submit that to the observation, submit that to study. And the goal then is to show how of their individual actions, how do these complex phenomena then emerge. That's, that's his agenda. So our object then is to find the essential qualities of these elemental components. And these are the qualities that make them what they are. In economics, what's the smallest unit? Well, it's the individual, right? I, 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 if I lop off my arm and I ask my arm, what does it want for breakfast, right? I'm not going to get an answer. That's, that's no good. So the smallest unit is, is the individual, and that's where we start. And now, after we look at what the essential qualities are, then we ask, what is the process by which that these interactions generate this complex phenomenon? And so the key then is the demonstration of the causal process by which the market phenomena emerge, they form, and change through time from their origin. Okay, and this is the individual subjective decision making that we're looking at. So Menger's approach is then called the genetic causal theory. You know, sometimes it's called that. And so here's a quote from Menger. It says, it must be pointed out that other social institutions, language, law, morals, especially, Numerous institutions of economy have come into being without any express written agreement, without legislative compulsion, even without any consideration of public interest, merely through the impulse of individual interest and as a result of the activation of these interests. Now many um, Austrian economists take this sort of statement and they run, they run the field with it. Because now what they're looking at is not just simply this, this relationship of buying and selling, what we're looking at is law, we're looking at uh, morals, we're looking at language, we're looking at social institutions, and we're applying it to a, a huge spectrum. And so you'll pick up a book and you're like, pirates? What's going on with pirates? How is this Austrian economics, right? Well, it is because it's following the Mengerian approach. Okay, so Menger then wrote uh, a couple of applications of this. And the most famous one is his origin of money. Where did money come from? And so he wrote this article on the origin of money back in 1892. And he's using and demonstrating his approach. So he says that um, money cannot come from the state. It has to come from the market. He demonstrates that no one could have invent invented it. Why? Why is that? He says, um, if we try to impose a money on society, it doesn't have any use value. Right? If I just print up little notes and let me keep, you know, Roy is king, and I print little notes of Roy, and he's looking all dapper and everything, and uh, I say, hey, barter society, King Roy has issued these notes, and I start trying to entice you guys to sell me stuff with these notes, you'd say, well, what's a Roy worth? Well, you wouldn't know. And as a result, no one would want to be the first person to jump into that. And so what, what, what Menger is able to do is show, look, it needs to evolve using use value, right? That's where you directly get value from the thing. And from a successive process then, we see that there are more goods that are more saleable than others. They outcompete other things, and they become the medium of exchange that's generally accepted and traded. And so in this, we see that, that we're examining the individuals. How do they act? Well, they have limited information. They've heterogeneous goals. Uh, how do I trade my stuff? I'm not just going to jump to money, right? If, I, if I've got strawberries and I'm going into town and they say, well, I need to get uh, material for clothes. I need to get uh, stuff to repair the roof. I need to get feed for the cows, right? And, and off I go to the village. Well, that would mean in a barter system, I'd have to find somebody who has feed for cows and wants strawberries. Someone who has clothes and wants strawberries, right? Well, I, don't, I can't find all those people. So I said, well, what's everyone else sort of trading? Well, a lot of people need, need grain. Oh, OK. Well, I'm going to trade my strawberries for the grain. And then from that, I'll trade, right? And so the, the, the grain then becomes this intermediary step. And more people say, oh, more people are using grain as this, this intermediary. And so it evolves as, as, as the money, right? No one actually sat down and planned it, right? So the most saleable thing, then, is this medium of exchange. And then Hayek, later on, popularized this by calling it a spontaneous ordering. Right? 
of spontaneous ordering. So no one's sitting down designing, and yet this amazingly useful thing, money, emerges. It's kind of, kind of the opposite of what you hear about, because it's supposed to be a public good that must be provided by government, and what he is actually arguing is exactly the opposite. Yeah, not in my class, you don't hear that. It's, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, it's, it's often presented that way. It's sort of that theory of it. And this is 1892, of course, right? Now, Mises later on, he, in 1912, he writes his first book on, on uh, money and, and the theory of money, and he, he really expands on the story. But, but its genesis is in, is in Menger. So do you really want to say that he, that he demonstrated this? Or, I mean, he's he does demonstrate it. Yes. But I mean, I wouldn't say, I, I mean, it's not like he observed it historically. That he is true. He hypothesizes he, that that's how money evolved. Yes. And, uh, yes. That there's is, there's people true. that would disagree. But, but there was there money are before government, people. right? What's so this? What? There was money before government. I'm not sure. And <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I don't think there was. And of course, but I can't do there's a famous it. example of cigarettes trading in a POW camp, right? Which no one decided. But that was not before government. I mean, like that was the no, government. Government, was the government. government oh. didn't impose cigarettes to be the right. right. Yeah. Who made the POW camp? <laughs> <laughs> well, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying that it was. I'm just saying, like you know, like demonstrates a very strong word. I'd say he hypothesizes that this is the case. Yeah, well, no, um, he's 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 okay. Yes. In a sense, it's it's a high. It's well, a hypothesis it's like because, he, he because we don't have a TARDIS, we can't go back in time, can't witness this our, ourselves. And there have been a few other competing theories. Um, but he deals <coughs> with, with the ones that, that preceded him. And so who preceded him? Well, uh, Aristotle, uh, 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 what's the, the Summa Theologica, Summa Theologica, Aquinas, Aquinas yeah, um, and uh, the Roman jurists, and and so and so some of the other uh, German authors um, were were actually suggesting that it was imposed by the state, and so so he does show how without use value, it doesn't work, right? No one's going to be the first mover, right? Right, and so you need an alternative plausible story, right? And so so that's that's what he presents. That's one of them. I mean, I, I won't derail this too much, but I would just note that there are other people that make different claims, and they look at, say, for example, uh, indigenous societies around the world, um, you know, in what you might consider, like, conditions that might resemble what, you know, mm -hmm. our ancestors' conditions might have, and, you know, you don't observe. Um, money there, you see transactions being made in other ways, um, namely through uh, debt and gift giving. Like, so that's the argument that David Graeber makes in his book, Debt. Um, I think you and I talked about this once last year, but it's been a while. Um, that's all I'll say. I'll just say that okay. like, this demonstrates as a strong word. There's well, I don't think he's saying that money will always evolve. So you're saying that something else, but the point I, the point he's making is um, that um, money um, uh, money will um, if you're going to have money, so money it is needs to be traced back to some sort of usable item. In other words, if the because it's Mises' regression theory, which is right, Mises' mm -hmm. regression theory. Okay. Yes. Um, so Milton Friedman's book, Money Mystery. He, one of the examples was these Pacific Islanders who used very large rocks. Yeah. I don't remember if those rocks had use other than money. Well, those those were that is the the island of yeah. Yeah, right. And, yeah. and there's there's you know the, the six ton ones, but then there are also smaller ones as well. And uh, uh, they are all over the island. Um, I think what I think oh, sh I'm trying to remember what the the full story was, but I think it evolved from shells. I think they started with like cowrie shells or something like that, and then that got evolved into stones. Um, if you look at like the Chinese coin, why does it have a hole in the center? Well, it has a hole in the center because it was originally a big ceremonial dagger, and then that got smaller, and then eventually there was a jewel there, and they pulled the jewel out, and then it was just a you know a, a disc with a circle in the middle. So um, 
it's fascinating to look at the history and the evolution of the currencies. Uh, and what um, and what Menger does is he gets us thinking along these lines that it's an evolutionary item that no one sat down and imposed it, and yet it still emerged, right? Um, so if you're saying that there are societies that don't use money, well, that's not really a criticism of what Menger's saying, right? Well, um, so, so I take that back. Uh, it's not that they don't use money. It's that the money that they use wasn't founded in a barter system. Like, Graeber's argument is that money began not as a medium of exchange, but as a unit of account, as an extension of these sorts of debt and gift giving societies. Mm -hmm. And so, I just, like, uh, the only reason I wanted to throw it out there is because, like, you made it, like, the language is very strong, and I just wanted to note that, like, demonstrates this off, like, very strongly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I still like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he does a good job demonstrating. So. Look, look at how this works. Second generation. Um, so Menger is, is the first uh, Austrian, and he spent most of his time in the debates of the German Historical School. He ends up mostly debating issues and items of, of methodology and the nature of science and the nature of social science. And so uh, it's really up to the second generation to really kind of take the ball and run farther down the field. And so, so who are the second generation? Well, it's primarily um, two guys who are brothers-in-law. You have Eugen von Bombaver, and then you have Friedrich von Wieser. Now, they never actually studied under Menger. They just read his book. But they, uh, they did meet with him. They did exchange uh, ideas. And they were some of his greatest followers. And so the three of them, uh, Menger, Bobovic, Wieser, um, they were the, what we call the core of the Austrian school. And sometimes if you read uh, like the Quarterly Journal of Economics back a uh, hundred and some years ago, you would see it as the Austrian school or the psychological school or even the subjectivist school. Um, and the, the Austrians thought that they were in the main stream. In the, in the 1890s, the 1900s, the 1910s, uh, Bobrick's works were, were required reading for decades, um, even in the United States up through the 1920s. Um, so, so let's take a look at Bombaver. So Bombaver and Wieser, they were brothers-in-law. Uh, brothers-in-law, yeah. So Bombaver married Wieser's sister. And when you see Wieser, you're going to hope that, that they didn't look alike. <laughs> So, so he was a professor at the University of Innsbruck, uh, and then eventually he uh, was going between government and the university, the government, the university. He was the finance minister of, of Austria for three times. His face, his portrait, is on the Austrian money. Now they use euros, so they don't have it anymore, but it was on the, uh, the 100 note, the 100 shilling, crown, I don't remember. But anyway, it was the 100 unit note. Um, should go look. I have it in my office. Um, but he's like the only economist. Now I think Scotland has since then put Adam Smith's face on one of their money just to do it. But uh, this was this was uh, the first economist on money. Uh, 1904, uh, he left government for the for the last time. He was frustrated with the government. He quit as finance minister. It caused the entire. Uh, uh, government to crumble. They had to then have a new election because of this. And why did he quit? He quit because he thought the military wanted too much money and they would run into a deficit. And he could not handle uh, their government going into deficit. That was just unconscionable. So at the University of Vienna, he held that chair until his death in 1914. So what did he do? Well, Bobert helped draw out and clarify uh, the underlying subjectivity of value. He showed how it is at the margin that all decisions are made. And he gives an example of a horse trading market. And, he's, and um, it's the famous phrase that comes out of this is the marginal pairs. Right? Who is the last buyer? Who is the last seller? Before no one else is willing to trade. And so that is the marginal pair. And based on the marginal pair, price will fall within that discrepancy between those that last buyer and that last seller. Now, the other thing was that he was using discrete units, right? When we draw supply and demand curves, they're continuous lines, right? He's using discrete units. And so he was allowing negotiation to, to finally set that, that, that final price between the two marginal pair. 
Um, and so it's through this analysis, he attacked Marxism. Uh, he wrote a book on the close of the Marxist system, right? Saying it's fundamentally flawed that it uses the labor theory of value and he, and he slams the book on it. Um, interestingly, there is uh, an, a book that was written called An Economic Theory of the Leisure Class, you think in Veblen? No, no, Bukharin. He sat in Bambalberg's lectures and uh, his seminars, and he wrote a book which, if you if you hold up Bambalberg's book and you hold up uh, Bukharin's book and you go one at a time, it's a direct attack. And then, of course, Bambalberg has a rejoinder for everything. You can't just let things slide. Uh, so it's it's interesting study in, in uh, intellectual history there. So. Bambalberg has uh, contributed in areas of the law and economics, and he addresses issues of, of even things like intellectual property rights, right? And this is something you're thinking, well, that's a modern issue. No. no he was writing about that over 100 years ago. Uh, turns out he was against patents and copyrights. Okay. So what's he known for? Well, he's best known for the areas of capital and interest. So it was a must read for about half a century, about 50 years. And it's large, it's uh, three volumes, but anyone who's doing this has to read it. So um, volume one is a history. Who came before him? And he basically slams everyone. He clears the field. And those that are the closest to him are the ones that he most viciously attacks. He has to differentiate himself. And um, so after he's done with that, he writes this basic principles of economic value. This is what Bukharin then attacks. But this is the core of his value theory. And he finds uh, a very similar uh, section in his volume two on capital and interest. Uh, and this is where he then extends the value theory into capital and interest. And then volume three, which comes out a few years later, is his response to critics. And he continuously updates these things. Uh, until he dies in, in 1914. Uh, there have been two major translations of this. One is by William Smart. This was a contemporary and who translated this. And then more recently, you have uh, Hans Senholtz translation. People say the William Smart one's a little bit better. The difference is this. Um, William Smart was translating it into English Senholtz was translating it from German. You're like, isn't that the same thing? No, Smart was a native English speaker who was translating it to his native English. Senholtz was a German speaker who was reading the German and then trying to translate it into English. So uh, the Smart version, actually, the English is a little bit cleaner um, of the two. Okay. So here's Wieser, right? I hope his sister doesn't quite look like that. Uh, he was the other half of the second generation. And uh, who did he teach? He was a Hayek's teacher and this other guy named uh, Hans Meyer. Uh, Bambaver was Mises' teacher. <coughs> now, who is Wieser? Most people don't know who he was. In fact, you look at Joseph Schumpeter's work on the 10 great economists, he, he puts 46 pages to Bambaver. Wieser stuck in the appendix and gets about three pages. That's it. Like, wow, there's a major difference. Um, so what was Wieser's claim to fame? Well, he's the first to define cost as a foregone opportunity. Now, we see a little bit of hints of this in Menger, but this is, this is Wieser. In fact, he, he clarifies this. And people start referring to it throughout the world, the United States, England, everywhere, as Wieser's Law. OK, so let's talk a little bit about the guy. So Wieser came from a long line of civil servants, and he was actually not interested in economics at first. He was looking at social phenomena, but he wanted to be a sociologist. But in order to do what he wanted to do, he said, well, I first have to clarify this economic relationship. But in order to clarify the economic relationship, I need to do what? I need to figure out value theory. So, so he kind of kind of says, well, this is what I really want to do, be a sociologist. But to do that, I need economics. But to do that, I need value theory. So he keeps backing himself up before he can get started. Right? Um, some people have that problem when writing dissertations. So, well, we write the, yeah, it, common problem. I know I've never had that problem before. So just pointing that out. <laughs> so, so what does he do? Well, the elaboration of value theory. Right? That's where he does most of his writing. 
Uh, and many think of uh, value theory, that's, that's just something we gotta get through so we can get to the good stuff, right? Well, he doesn't. He, he actually finds that this is the interesting stuff. And this is where he, he uh, spends most of his time. So, so everyone who kind of wants to rush through value theory, they kind of skip over Wieser. And so even Austrians aren't all that familiar with him. So after graduating, uh, both he and Bumbaber, they read Manger's Principles. So this is after they graduate. That's when they read the book. The book. And that book right there, it changed their lives. So let's talk a little bit more about the two guys. So in 1876, Wieser and Bumbaber, they're at the University of Heidelberg with Karl Nies. Now, that's Karl Nies there. He's a German historical school guy. Okay, this is the enemy. Well, of course, they don't know this yet, but, but he, he's the enemy. Um, so he's in the German historical school, but, but Wieser and Bobovic, they're attending his seminars, and they present papers. Now, when they present papers, these are like, like your master's thesis, right? This is something important uh, that you're con contributing. So Bobovic's paper is on what? Capital theory. But uh, Wieser's paper was on this relation to cost and value. And it's in this paper is where the first formulation of opportunity cost really starts to, to, to take shape. So Wieser's idea was received with great applause. This is one of the greatest things. No, no. Uh, cold, cold reception, especially from the German historical school that say there aren't any universal theories. So what did Wieser do? Well, he takes it to Menger. He says, look, look at this. And Menger looks at it and goes, I don't think so. Menger wasn't really interested in it, which is kind of odd. But over time, he's undeterred. He spends the next seven years writing and refining this first book. And then when that came out, uh, Menger did completely change. He said, yes, this is great. I love it. So what is his first book? Well, his first book came out in 1884. It's not translated into English. It's in German. And it tackled the theory of subjective value and introduced the idea of opportunity cost. Now, in this, he called it indirect utility. But his extension is of Menger, and that's a significant extension. So Menger's theory did not include application of the structure of production. He didn't uh, apply it to the distribution of income. What does Wieser do? That's what he does. He applies it to these things. So this is a quote from Hayek about Wieser. Because remember, Hayek was Wieser's student. Hayek says, this changed all with the introduction of the concept of marginal utility. Its application to production goods, cost is indirect utility, opportunity cost, and imputation of value. All <coughs> concepts that first appeared in Wieser's book and that now belong to the core of economic theory. Where is it? It's all the way back here. This is its origin. Now, Wieser wrote four <coughs> books in total, but I'm going to skip to the third book because that's a bit more complete. Natural value is the second book. That one is in English, and you can find that. His third book is called Social Economics. It came out in 1914. Uh, it's a comprehensive treatise on economics. And here's what Hayek says about this book. He says, and now this is, this is a long quote. I, I apologize for it, but it's important. He says, in terms of intellectual consistency and elegance, it's undoubtedly inferior to Bombavik's work in economic analysis. That's high praise, right? It's inferior. But... The fault lies with the incomparably greater number of phenomena taken into account by a visa. The greater approximation to the uh, multifacetedness of reality makes it unavoidable that many things are only suggested and not completely worked through, that many points seem irreconcilable. For anyone who gives primacy to the complete logical consistency, Bombavik's self-contained system will certainly seem more impressive. I mean, this is why Rothbard really liked von Bauer, Wieser not so much. Um, Wieser's work offers incomparably more as a point of departure for further elaboration, perhaps because it's the very parts that have been criticized as inconsistent. Furthermore, this is still high, I know it's a long quote, he says the major improvement of social economics consists of preceding the theory of simple economics with an extensive section that does not deal at all with the theory of value. In this introductory section, he covers the structure of production in great detail and analyzes the behavior elicited by any given economic situation so thoroughly that in the subsequent section, difficult problems of valuation just fall into place. 
The most important findings from this investigation of the structure of production are Wieser's capital theory and the distinction between the cost productive means and the specific productive means, which in value theory serves as a basis for the highly important distinction between various marginal utilities, a distinction that Wieser never fully developed, however, and that is therefore poorly understood. So Hayek is defending his teacher. He says, look, he has his deficiencies. He's not as logically rigorous as Bombaver. All that is true. It's not self-contained, right? He's kind of all over the place. Smith was all over the place. Ricardo makes this self-contained system. A lot of people like Ricardo because of that, right? So there's, there's your analogy. It's not a perfect analogy. But um, so people ran with Bombaver. But I think today, especially if you're looking at a lot of what the modern Austrians are doing when they're, when they're uh, reading Hayek and they're looking at some of these spontaneous order projects and applying them to different social institutions, go back to Wieser and you'll find that he probably talked about a little bit about what you're investigating. This is a, an interesting source of material that's, that's not really been brought forward. That, he said it's not translated. No, the, third, the second, third, and fourth book are. The first book is not. So social economics. Social economics is, and natural value is, and the fourth book is law and power. And in this, he kind of gets swept up in the uh, um, the Nietzsche idea of the Superman and uh, that sort of uh, primacy of uh, certain intellectual types, especially like German intellectual types in the 1930s. And he went down that path, um, not completely. Uh, but most of his life, he was he was uh, what we would call libertarian or classical liberal. Uh, but he did dabble in on you know, the dark side from time to time. So, okay. Um, Social economics, though, his uh, third book was published in 1914 in German, just a few weeks before World War One starts. It didn't get didn't get the uh, the wide circulation that that it should have. Uh, Wieser retires in 1922, um, and then Menger's chair was then passed to Hans Meyer. So it went from uh, Menger to Wieser to Hans Meyer. Okay, so that's it for the Austrians. Right now, there are a whole bunch of other early Austrians that uh, uh, most people are unaware of. So we have uh, British, Scottish, American, so Philip Wick Steed, William Smart, Frank Fetter, and then there were fellow travelers like David Green. Um, New Excel. So I want to take a look at a couple of these guys. So the first one is David Green. Now David Green was over at Johns Hopkins. A little bit before your time. Yeah, a smidge. Yeah, 1925. Yeah. <laughs> so Green was the first to actually use the phrase opportunity cost. This is in uh, 1894. So he was reading Wieser and he coins the term. So it comes from uh, uh, David Green. And then actually he, he reformulated it in, a, in an even more subjectivist way. So uh, it's in the Quarterly Journal of, of Economics. Uh, you can take a look at that. It's, it's an interesting article. Um, Green argued that the cost is based upon the chooser's point of view. The cost of an action is a might have been. And uh, the next best choice before the actor is, not, is the one that's not chosen. That's the cost. Thus the cost of the choice is purely based upon the future because the future is changeable and is completely subjective. Uh, Philip Wicksteed. Here's uh, Philip Wicksteed. He was a Unitarian minister, and uh, he had a, a broad range of scholarship. Uh, but he published two economics books, the, the Alphabet of Economic Science and uh, The Common Sense of Political Economy. The first one there uh, is just two chapters long. It's a, it's a short little thing, uh, about 80 pages. Um, the first chapter is... Um, if you don't understand calculus, this is a great book because it takes you in an excruciatingly slow and painful step-by-step -step approach what calculus is and how to build it up and, and very, very slow. But you, you get there. You will understand it of, of what a change in the rate of means when you finish reading that, those 50 pages. The second half, then, is, is on value theory and such. But I want to I want to focus in on, on just a couple of points of Wick's team, uh, particularly his his um, look at value. 
So he stressed that, he cannot, that economists cannot make interpersonal utility comparisons. Right? I don't know what your valuing of this item happens to be. Uh, so, kind of updating it a little bit. Suppose that there are two people who face the same choice, a $4 meal, right? So you have a coupon at a fast food restaurant. And you got a rich guy and you got a poor guy. And each can um, have this <coughs> coupon. So all they have to do is give the coupon in $4 and they will get the meal. Now, the rich guy says, yeah, I'll buy one. Sure, four bucks for the meal, not a problem. The poor guy says, I'm not going to buy any meals. Okay, is it because the rich guy values the meal more than the poor guy? Is that why he's making this choice? All right. Does it mean that the, the rich guy values the meal more than the poor guy? Uh, no. In fact, the poor guy may value the, the meal much more than the rich guy. Right. So why doesn't he buy it? Well, because maybe he values the gallon of milk that he's going to buy and, and take home to his family more than he values the meal to himself. Each person makes this choice based on his own relative marginal utility. So the rich guy's opportunity cost was lower than the meal, so he bought it. The poor guy, right, maybe he's looking at this gallon of milk for his kids versus the meal, and he says, you know, the gallon of milk is more important to me than, than the meal. So he doesn't buy the meal. We can't make a conclusion of who valued the meal more, the rich guy or the poor guy. We can't make that interpersonal comparison. Um, so Wick Steed says we cannot uh, infer any more than what we observe. All we observe is this guy bought it and this guy didn't. Um, and then he makes this, this quote. I like this quote. Uh, when two men give the same thing, it's not the same thing they give. So if you have two people that each give you $10, they're not giving you the same thing. Because the value to them of what they're giving you is different. Right? So you have the, the rich guy who donates to, to his church and just, you know, puts $10 into the basket. And then you have the, the widow, right? And she gives three cents or whatever, right? But it's all that she had, right? You can't make that sort of interpersonal utility comparison between the two. So that's where Steve, uh, one, of his, one of his finer points. Uh, so here's William Smart, picture of William Smart. And um, he was the translator of, um, of uh, Bumbawert stuff. So at first he worked uh, as a manufacturer and a merchant before he went to academia. And then he taught these classes uh, up in Glasgow. So he was a Scot. Um, and then he was assigned the Adam Smith chair. So, in addition to writing papers and pamphlets himself, he translated Mbavrik into English, did a, a pretty good job of it, actually. And uh, he also wrote a, a, a little short book. It's called An Introduction to the Theory of Value. And he, he's attended these, these Austrian seminars, right? He speaks German. And um, uh, this book, it's online, it's in PDF. Get it, read it. It's a, it's a fantastic little uh, introduction to to um, Austrian economics. So it's got Menger's marginal analysis in it. It's got Wieser's concept of opportunity cost, von Bauwerk's idea of marginal pairs, uh, the Austrian view of the imputation of value in it. Uh, it's it's a nice little thing. But when you get that, get the first volume, or I'm sorry, the first edition. Because the second edition, that came out in 1910. It's got virtually the same thing as the first edition. But then he has the final appendix. So go ahead and read this too. But what the second edition shows is that there is a major influence by Alfred Marshall on, Adam, uh, uh, on Smart. So what did Alfred Marshall do? Well, this is where, after he's already published uh, his principles, he starts talking about the, the pair of scissors, right? Which blade cuts the paper? Is it the supply curve or the demand curve that forms the price? Well, it's both, right? But what Marshall says is uh, that the demand is the subjective side and the supply curve is an objective side. And so in the second edition, in this, this final appendix, Smart says, well, maybe it's not subjective on desirability and subjective on availability. Maybe it is 
subjective and objective. And so objective factors start creeping into his analysis, taking him away from the purely subjective school. Um, okay, so what's the conclusions here? Well, the early Austrians thought they were mainstream. They thought that they were economists along with everyone else. In fact, it's not until the 1930s that, that we see any differences, right? They're speaking the same language. They're, they're using the same phrases and terminology, but, but some of the concepts are not the same. Um, maybe we can have another uh, lecture on, on, on some of those things. But uh, the differences don't really pop up until the economic calculation debate in the 1930s. And it's there where, where Hayek went to London and he starts talking to London School of Economics and others when they start realizing, well, we're really not saying the same thing. We're, we might be using similar words and phrases, but when we talk about marginality, right, um, the Austrians are always using uh, discrete units. And we're looking at marginal pairs, and we're looking at, at uh, uh, this in our approach to the, to the law of diminishing marginal utility, and, uh, and then uh, the law of increasing opportunity cost, and our derivation of law of demand and law of supply. In indifference curve analysis, for example, your utility curve is, or your indifference curve has one utility. And so what's the marginality on? Right? It's the slope there, it's that marginal rate of substitution. It's not the marginal utility changing with the next good. Right? It's not utility that changes with the when I buy the next good. There's a slight difference there. It's an important difference. And so maybe we can talk about that in, in the near future. Uh, but that's a whole other lecture. Uh, so Menger, Bambavik, Wieser, they didn't intend to create a separate school. Right? It was just an unintended consequence of their actions. Right? That, that's, that's, that's my, my best joke there. It doesn't get any better, but I, I thought it was funny. All right, so uh, the Austrians then, uh, today, we tend to read the founders, the, the classics, because there, there's a depth and a, and a richness in all of them. And um, you know, we look at uh, others in our profession, and they say, "Well, that journal article is five years old, so why, why bother?" Right? Uh, the Austrians are very different because it's a continuation of of a building process. Um, our methodology is different; it's not a positivistic one. It's a, and so, so we, we can go back to Wieser and uncover things that he talked about a hundred and some years ago, and say, "Oh, I need to update that and bring it into today." So. Anyway, um, if you have any questions or, or comments on any of this, just go ahead and email me. Uh, please uh, go to the stores and download the, uh, the free app. And uh, we have some time for questions. I wanted to get through this really, you know, sort of, sort of quickly to, to get the questions. And uh, I'll have to, to leave fairly right after this so I can go stab people for my kids. <coughs> Uh, but luckily, we have a true Austrian expert here, uh, Roy Cardato, um, and so he'll also so much, answer all your questions. Not so much on the early, uh, but I mean, Pizer, <clears throat> who I want, I want to focus yeah. on because, um, and I don't know if this is a bummer app or not, but um, he is often credited uh, for uh, giving us uh, the idea that, um, that progressive income tax. Uh, can be used to increase social utility um, because you're because the rich man values the, the marginal dollar um, less than the poor man, and so if you take that marginal dollar away from the rich man and give it to the poor man, you're going to increase social utility, which flies in the face of you know, oh, value oh, theory. And and and, and, uh, and is that true? I've never, I mean, I haven't read enough Beezer to know whether that's true or not, but. Uh, I've always heard that said, and I'm, you know, maybe you've been taught that in history, you kind of thought that somewhere along, along the line. And so, I think we have the same professors. Uh, <laughs> maybe so, that's right. Yeah, Eklund, right? Um, so, is that a bum rap, or sh should you be thinking of him when you, you know, go with your sword later on? And, uh, uh, yeah. Wieser contradicts himself uh, in, in places. So, uh, and, and Hayek alludes to this in his quote, where he says, you know, he'll take two positions that are irreconcilable because I guess he just didn't 
didn't quite get through it all. Um, so um, my recollection is is he takes both positions. Like you can't make interpersonal utility comparisons, but then I think he does later on in I think it's in social economics or is it law and power? I haven't read law and power, so um, so I have to go on what others have told me about that one. But I think in that one, it, law and power is is um, there's a, a translation. It's in, in, into English. It is, you have to go interlibrary loan to find it because you really can't buy it, I guess. And um, then you have to make your own copy. It's almost like someone just manually typed the translation and it's at like two or three university libraries. Um, so that's how Ben Brachik got it. I think that's how Evelyn got it. So, um, so from what they've told me, um, I believe, yes, he does, does make that claim. And he's roundly criticized by the rest of the Austrians for making that blunder, and, and I would say rightly so. Um, and then that's you know that's just human. We make errors. So, uh, Wicksteed, I think, is, is much better on this point with his uh, interpersonal utility comparison. And so um, you know, they're, they're they're not they're not all perfect for, by any means. So yeah, I think he does get the. the Get the wrap and the dust, you know, rightly so, to a degree. Go ahead. Does the value theory of Menger and his and the next generation become something like a demand curve, or do they never mention price? It's all about price formation, right? How are prices formed? Where do they come from? Uh, Menger is a journalist, and he's and, and, he's and they do that without the supply, without the other side of the scissor. They 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 impute value without. Up no, Menger was Menger was was ex explicitly said explicitly said that if if we're if there's more availability than the number of means, mm -hmm. right? Well, then it doesn't have a price. Okay, so that, that's so kind of, that's a Boolean argument. That, that doesn't make a straight line. That's just one point. It says if right, and so and so as price. you decrease, right? Okay. Well, what what Menger ends up doing is he creates these. these these categories, and so he has ten categories. And if you can, you can apply uh, means to one end. Which do you do? And so he takes the first one of the first category, and then he says, if you can do two things, he goes from the first to the second. So he has two units from the first category. Now, if you can do three things, he'll take the first two units of the first category, and then the first unit of the second category. And so this is how people. He describes demand, so, so, so it's not a very, you know. So, so there is a supply curve implied. Well, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. But, but we we have to remember at this time, um, this this notion of a supply curve and and it's differentiating it with demand is is uh, you see supply and demand they're the same law. It's just a matter of perspective. They're not they're not two different things. Yeah, that was that's the the chart that I'll. That you'll get to read in that book, uh, but but supply and demand are the, they're the same law. It just depends on which which side of the counter you're on, right? Um, and so, so it's the law of diminishing marginal utility and the law of increasing opportunity cost are simply an ends means framework, right? How do I then value the marginal unit? Back over 100 years ago, we didn't even call it, well, some people call it supply curve, but there was a movement to actually call it reciprocal demand or reservation demand is as a rejection to even calling it supply as something different. And, and it's not until we see Marshall where he says that it's the supply curve is this objective thing that, that and, and, and that's where, where I think you see the separation then start to form between the continental Austrians and, and the, uh, the Americans and the English. Right, in, in, this, in this theory. But even then, you have you know, Rick Steed, who's very much a subjectivist. So, so if you say supply and demand are two very different things, no, they wouldn't agree with that either. They're both the same law. Make sense, Gonzo? Mm -hmm. no? no. No. But, but, but it, I need a book worth of something. Go, go ahead. Um, so if people are trading A for B, uh -huh. then you can say, what? For one person, A is what's supplied and B is what's demanded, and for the other person, B is what's supplied and A is what's demanded. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So you can think of it as I'm buying money for the product. Absolutely, yes. You are, you are simultaneously demanding and supplying at the same time. Right? I'm buying an apple and supplying dollars. He's buying dollars and supplying an apple. You see that, Rich? And, and the, the, the point is, is that the value of the higher order good, the, the input, comes from the value of the of the of, final good. of the final good. Okay. Consumer. But at every stage, the price of that good is the demand for it, which is comes from the value, and the supply, which comes from scarcity. So um, at every point, the price is determined by supply and demand. I mean, there's not, he's not escaping that. What he's saying is, ultimately, though, the reason why there's a demand for that input is because there's a demand for the output, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's really the point. But at every step, there's a price determined by intersection of supply, 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 and demand. Yeah, it's, it's imputed through the, the, the structure of production. But Manger doesn't really deal with a structure of production. It's not until, until later on through uh, Visor. And to, to a small degree, we also see it in Mamabra. Uh, that, that we see this, this imputation through uh, all the different input and factor markets. So, anyway, there's, there's a lot of, of material here that's probably new to, to most of you. Um, how many of you have, have, have read Menger and Wieser and, and Mauer a little bit? Just some? Just Menger. Just Menger? That's a good place to start. Um, if, uh, if I could uh, point to a couple of things, I would say uh, reading the Bobert's basic uh, value book that, uh, that he did, it kind of came in between uh, volume one and volume two. Uh, that would be a good place to start. Um, let's see if I can, yeah, 1886, it's called Basic Principles of uh, Economic Value. Um, so what that does is it takes out of out of his capital interest volume two and is just on value theory, these issues of value theory. And um, Bambavik had these these seminars. Now Mises, of course, uh, was a student of Bambavik, and then he recreated the seminars himself. But Bambavik's uh, seminars were world famous, and we had people from from uh, all over the world uh, attend these things. And so Nikolai Bukharin was one of those. Now. Who's Nikolai Bukharin? Well, he was uh, Vladimir Lenin's right-hand man for, for quite some time, and he was uh, highly influential in the organization of the Soviet Union economy. And so what he did was he wrote a book uh, that basically was from, basically, you know, he took basic principles and kind of wrote his own book, and he's arguing it, right? So if you read Bukharin's book without reading it, you're like, what the heck is this guy referring to, right? You almost have to read them together, go, go section by section. You're like, oh, okay, now I see what he's, what he's doing. Um, and he's, he's arguing uh, from the Marxist perspective against the Austrians. Uh, so that's uh, called the economic theory of the leisure class, not to be confused with Veblen's theory of the leisure class. So, uh, um, on the dark. Um, is apparently, and they don't know this, because uh, uh, I'm not a finance person, but apparently Bumbogart is, is well known in, among finance scholars. Uh, I remember when I, gosh, when I first went to Campbell, uh, the finance professor there, he said, oh, an Austrian, Bumbogart. And I didn't know what he was referring to, but, um, I was the only name, he was the only name in Austrian economics at this that I knew, which was, I thought was really odd. Um, do you know what that connection is yes, between Bob yes. and, and finance? It's his interest theory, right? Um, so, Bob uh is one of the, well, so he, write, he writes three volumes on capital and interest, and he, and, he, and he clears the ground in the first volume, and so the second volume was, was eagerly anticipated. And so in that, he says there are these reasons for the formation of interest. And of these reasons, they're all subjective except for the last one. And that one, he says, aha, it is this objective factor. But he kind of downplays it. But 
then there are times when he's in the middle of an argument and it's convenient for him to win the argument. That's kind of where he, where he brings it back and, and uses it to, uh, to expedite his argument. Um, and so people look at, at, um, at Bumbaver then, who, who's creating this, this um, subjectivist demand side, objectivist supply side creation of the, of the interest rate. And then you have uh, Irving Fisher then, who then takes that and runs with it. Of course, he wrote uh, Theory of Interest in 1907, I think, 1908, something like that. Uh, and, and this is where you get the, the Fisher uh, formula about uh, real versus nominal, and and you know that's you know, the finance guys. Of course, then are are focused on interest rates, interest rate formation, and all of that. And it's from that that, that they then start spinning their, their stuff. So they, they trace their origin to to um, Now Frank Fetter, who is uh, an American economist, um, actually looked at what uh, Bombaver had to say on interest rates. And he, he argued with Bumbaver. He said, no, the, uh, the objectivist side needs to be ripped out. It has to be purely subjectivist on both the demand side and the supply side. And, uh, and if you read uh, the modern Austrians, uh, we, we tend to conclude that, that uh, Bumbaver was wrong on that point, and, and Fetter was right. Um, the other major, major area of uh, contribution was um, this area of capital theory. Maybe we can have a lecture on, on capital theory, where uh, Bobrick says that, that capital is this heterogeneous structure of, of different things. And his opponent in this debate, you see, they, they, they tend to, to debate much more, uh, was this guy named John Bates Clark. We've probably heard of the, you know, the Clark Medal or the Clark Award. Uh, John Bates Clark argued that once you get something up and running, then it's just self-perpetuating. That, that savings then in capital can be thought of as a fund, as, as this blob that can be malleable. And so over time, I can take a whaling ship and convert it into a shoe factory, right? Um, and so, so this debate then took place between John Bates Clark and Bumbawark in the, in the early 1890s and Neither side you know, was convinced by the others. It kind of dies away for a few years, and then it took back up. They kicked it back up like 10 years later in the, the, the 06s, 07s. And they're, they're same issues, same debate, same pattern, same issues, uh, uh, and again, neither side resolved it. Now, John Bates Clark had a student or a follower whose name was Frank Knight. Now, Frank Knight then picks up John Bates Clark's approach Bumbavrk and the Austrians have a student, his name is Friedrich Hayek, and then in the 1930s there's a major clash again on capital theory. So Frank Knight versus Hayek, and this takes place between the two uh, men, and then uh, and Frank Knight had a student whose name is Milton Friedman. And so, so we can trace Milton Friedman's theory on capital all the way back to this debate between Clark and Bumbavrk. And so uh, Leland Yeager, uh, who's uh, brilliant guy on my dissertation committee quipped often that uh, Milton Friedman was brilliant on a great many things, but he was uh, irrevocably damaged by Frank Knight on, on capital theory. There's just no saving him there. So That, that capital debate, which I, um, it's hard, but that's another story. It's, it's, it's long, it's complex, but, but it's that is a, immensely that, interesting. Yeah, it is, but just the, the People know. I mean, it is a long-standing debate um, between Austrians and various Chicago schools. Most other uh, schools. Um, most other schools. Most of it, it was not all. Knight was Chicago. Friedman was Chicago. I don't know if Bates was uh, Clark was Chicago or not. But John Bates Clark. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know, but. Anyway, it's sort of it, 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 certainly Knight and then Friedman, yeah. and then other Chicago people. I, I, I used to have this debate with my old boss, Norman Ture, who was Knight's student, <coughs> Frank Knight's student. Um, and, uh, but it's an ongoing debate that continues to this day. Well, but then that leads to the question why, why is this important? Why is the capital debate important? Uh, and, and the answer is because you get different, different conclusions. 
your analysis fundamentally changes if uh, capital is dehomogenized. And as a result, you, you cannot simply aggregate the way that we do and just run with it. And, and the argument against it is if it's so heterogeneous, how do I ever get to an answer? Right? And so, so there's this immense difficulty um, for many economists to, to say, how do I move the ball forward if it's just so complex? Right? And, uh, and then you get a clash on methodology because under uh, things like positivism, you're right. It is hard to go forward. Um, so, yes, Rich. I wonder, is there a single book that tells both sides of that debate that you're talking about? The there are several books that, that talk about this. Not one of them is the one that you say, ah, that's the good one. Okay. Um, like Mark Skousen tried to write a book on, on the, the Chicago, Chicago School, the School of Vienna. And, and, um, then there's the, the Keynes versus Hayek books that, that are all out there and rap data. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but quite honestly, just, just go to JSTOR, um, download the articles from the Quarterly Journal of Economics. <coughs> Uh, from the 1890s, and they're they're very readable, right? There's not all this math jargon that you see today, uh, you know. And you'll you'll read about uh, Clark talking about uh, uh, synchronization and how you can think of it as a fund, and that how capital then transforms. And once you put something in place, time becomes irrelevant because there's no waiting. So so you have a a factory, you put the input in, and immediately you have an input out. Why? Because you have inputs all through the thing. So once it's all built, there's no, no need for time. So time collapses. And um, uh, Bob of course, argued against all of these sorts of things. You know, this is ridiculous. So, um, go read, read, those, read those articles. Uh, there's not too many of them. Um, maybe <coughs> half a dozen or so in the first round. And then um, about the same amount, or maybe a little bit fewer in the second round. And then I don't remember how many are in the Hayek uh, Knight debates because after Knight sort of stops, other people picked it up, and Hayek had to had to fight them off too with a, with a big stick. So, um, that that way, the way the most brutal view oh, yes. of, of Menger's principles. Yes. So this was done by Frank Knight. Okay. So it's, so Men Menger's um, Menger is not easy to read in German. I don't read German. My wife reads German. Uh, her family is German. She grew up speaking German in her household. Um, and she was asked by a friend of ours, Richard Ebeling, if uh, she could translate a, an article written by Menger. Who, by the way, spoke to those. Yes, yes, a few years ago. Um, but um, uh, she, she was almost in tears because it was so difficult to translate this, this Menger article. And I said, well, can't you read it? I can read it, but I don't know how to how to translate it, right? I'm like, well, just, just do it. Yeah. No, no. So so she was in great distress, and so then I I picked up um, the the second book, second translated book by uh, by Menger called Investigations, and um, the the translator said Menger is incredibly difficult to translate. So it made her feel a whole lot better, and the result of Menger being so difficult to translate into English is that his book, Principles, wasn't translated into English until 1940. I think it was 1940, right? And, and, uh, and that means what? That means throughout the, the, the big heyday of all of this discussion that we were just covering, the English speakers did not have access to this German book. And as a result, they said, OK, here it's out. Let's give it to a famous economist to write the introduction. So they picked Frank Knight, right? He knows something about Menger. Well, Knight just got through being in this huge intellectual battle with an Austrian over capital theory. And so he writes this intro. It is one of the most scathing intros one has ever seen to a book. And he's just, he's just ripping them apart viciously. And you're like, I don't think I want to read this. So, uh, so then. Uh, in the in the next uh, edition, they, they they ripped that out, and they they had Hayek write a, an introduction to to Menger, but uh, it was it was vicious. So. It's unbelievable. <laughs>
<laughs> just don't see people writing like that. No, no, because academics, we're, we're so above all that sort of stuff, aren't we? We're just, we're just in the area of ideas, the You're mind. Don't like, take anything personal. It's like Donald Trump is. Oh, my goodness. George it was, it was, Jeff Bush. Yeah. it was bad. It was, so, so if you ever want to see how scholarship should not be done. <laughs> <laughs>